Alright, hi guys. I am gonna Ten creepy messages are left by serial killers. We have discussed numerous serial killers on this channel to analyze the complex nature of their crimes and personalities. One of the biggest clues as to who they really are as people are the messages they Sorry, I don't need to kick my... These messages come in the form of letters, journal entries, or even actual messages left behind at their own crime scenes. So that's what we're going to be having a look at today. So here are 10 creepy messages left behind by serial killers. Number one, Dennis Rader is a serial killer who murdered 10 victims in Wichita, Kansas between 1974 and 1991. He was dubbed the BTK killer, which stands for blind torture kill, after he suggested the nickname himself in a haunting letter written to a local news station following the murders. His murder spree began with a strangulation and suffocation of four members of the same family. His nickname came from his method of killing, and he would often masturbate over victims' bodies after the murder. BTK <laughs> would send messages directly to news organizations it's at the station, while also leaving some messages taped to street signs and in some vehicles parked in stores. These letters would detail the murders, including his methods of killing and his victims' last words. Before strangling one of his first victims, Julie Otero, BTK wrote that she begged for him to spare her family and said, God have mercy on you as she died. He continued to write that her 11-year-old daughter cried, I love you, before he ended her life. His ego and desire for attention is further magnified in a statement from his letter to a news station reading, How many people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper? His continued correspondence would ultimately lead to his arrest. In 2004, BTK asked the police if they could trace information from a floppy disk, to which they replied that they couldn't. He then sent a floppy disk with another disturbing message, and from this, metadata was recovered from a deleted document associated with a local church that was last modified by Dennis. As it turns out, the BTK killer, later identified as Dennis Rader, appeared to be an average man president of his local church, a married father of two children, and a scout leader. He was a U.S. Air Force veteran and had been employed by ADT security services, ironically installing alarms for customers who were fearful of the BTK serial killer on the loose. His security company and military experience are what helped him gain access to victims' homes. In 2005, Dennis Rader was arrested and pled guilty to all 10 murders. He is serving 10 consecutive life sentences in El Dorado Correctional Facility. Number 2. The ex-man of New Orleans was a serial killer in Louisiana from May 1918 to October 1919. This serial killer claimed the lives of at least 12 known victims, usually killing them with their own axe or sword. Victims' homes were broken into with a chisel during the night, and strangely, no items were removed from the homes, suggesting that the motive was not theft. All victims were of Italian descent, leading experts to believe the attacks may have been <laughs> Some believe that the murders may have been related to the mafia, as no sure connections have been made to validate this idea. On March 13, 1919, a letter was sent to a newspaper that was said to have been sent by the Axeman, and its message contained an odd proposition. The Axeman stated, at 12.15 on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. This letter in which the killer refers to himself as a spirit and a demon from hell led hundreds of homes in New Orleans to host jazz parties with live bands that played all night. No murders were committed, and the Axeman never made an appearance again. The killer remains unidentified, and only swirling speculation surrounds the event today. No one can begin to guess what the true motivations were behind these crimes, and why the killing stopped so suddenly. This story continues to contribute to the haunted lore of the Indians. Number 3 During the Great Depression in the 1930s, a killer known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run preyed upon the impoverished communities of Cleveland, Ohio. The 
Press referred to this event as the Cleveland Torso Murders. What are you doing? The murder claimed at least 13 people, most of whom were never identified. The first two victims were men who were found decapitated with their genitals removed. It is believed that mutilation occurred after death due to a lack of blood. The precise method and professional manner of decapitation led investigators to believe that the murderer was done by either a surgeon or a professional butcher, which later gave the killer his nickname. These lists of murders continue to grow, and as a result of the local hysteria, famed lawman Elliot Ness was brought in to solve the crimes. Ness believed that all of the victims came from the local homeless shanty towns. He considered that the mad butcher might be living among the homeless in these same camps. After years of I murder, Appeared to work as the murder ceased. That is, until the mad butcher sent a letter to the newspaper taunting Elliot Ness. It reads You can rest easy now, as I have come to sunny California for the winter. I felt bad operating on those people, but science must advance. I shall astound the medical profession. What did their lives mean in comparison to hundreds of sick and diseased, twisted bodies? Just laboratory guinea pigs found on any public street. Nobody missed them when I failed. My last case was successful. I now know the feeling of Pasteur, Thoreau, and other pioneers. This eerie message suggests a kind of egotistical mad scientist, and more disturbingly, the mad butcher claims in this letter to have killed more victims while in California, although no more murders have been attributed to him. The mad butcher remains unidentified, and the failure to capture him haunted Elliot Ness until his death. Number four. Keith Hunter Jefferson, known as the Happy Face Killer, committed eight known murders in the U.S. between 1990 and 1995, although he claims that this number is closer to 160 women. Jefferson came from a troubled childhood and was alienated by his own family and beaten by an alcoholic father. His siblings mocked him with nicknames like Igor because of his large physical stature. He killed animals as a child by beating and strangling them and at a young age of 10, attempted to beat another child to death and later attempted to drown another. Despite his troubled history, he married and fathered three children while becoming a truck driver to support his family. His first known murder didn't occur until 1990 when he met a woman at a bar named Tanya Bennett near Portland, Oregon. She returned to his home with him, but after she refused to have intercourse with him, he beat her to death and disposed of the body. Another person was initially arrested of the murder, and Keith's desire for attention led him to scrawl a message on the stall of the truck stop bathroom claiming responsibility for her murder. He signed it with a happy face. It read, I killed Tanya Bennett, January 21st, 1990, in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her, and loved it. Yes, I'm sick, but I enjoyed myself too. People took the blame and I'm free, so I can kill again. When he didn't receive the attention he desired for his message, he began writing to newspapers detailing his life and crimes. Although his preferred method of murder was strangulation and beating, his most gruesome crime occurred when he strapped a young female hitchhiker to the undercarriage of his truck in order to grind her face and fingernails. After a divorce, Keith began dating Julianne Winningham, but later decided she was only interested in him for money and murdered her too. This murder would prove to be his downfall as it was the only victim directly tied to him. This led to his arrest in 1995 after he attempted suicide twice and turned himself in. He later wrote a letter to his brother confessing to eight murders, which he would later be charged for. Although he has not been charged with over 100 murders that he claims to be responsible for, his job as a truck driver would certainly have provided the means. He often murdered sex workers and hitchhiking women who would prove to be difficult to confirm or identify. Keith is currently serving three consecutive life sentences in Oregon State Penitentiary and continues to write letters to collectors of serial killer memorabilia, always signing them with his signature happy face. Number five. Habib Riyal, a serial killer in Pakistan who, in 1999, sent a letter to police and a newspaper confessing to the sexual abuse, murder, and dismemberment of a hundred boys. Crimes were said to have been committed in less than eight months and led to the largest manhunt in Pakistan to find him. Mughal had sodomized and strangled the children and was 
and then dismembered their bodies and placed them in vats of acid to dissolve the remains. When police searched his home, they found the bloody chain that he used to strangle his victims, vats of acid with partially dissolved remains, and photographs of the victims labeled with handwritten notes. He kept diaries describing the murders and later, in his confession, stated, I hate this world. I am not ashamed of my actions and I am ready to die. I have no regrets. He later turned himself into a local newspaper in of course he don't. To a fair trial. He claimed to have killed the children and in form of revenge for an earlier sodomy arrest in the 1990s in which he was never charged but was brutally beaten. In Mughal's own words, I was so badly beaten that my head was crushed, my backbone broken, and I was left crippled. My mother cried for me. I wanted a hundred mothers to cry for their children. Gaul was able to commit these murders because of the large number of children living on the streets of Pakistan. He was also very rich following a large inheritance from his father and used his money to expand his villa and started a string of failed small businesses in order to lure young boys for abuse. These businesses included a video game store, an aquarium, and a school. Mughal also lured boys via pen pal programs and would send them gifts ultimately leading to an arrangement to meet. Ah, uh, I remember those. A controversial <laughs> sentence was passed by a judge in which Mughal would be strangled with a metal chain cut into 100 pieces and dissolved in acid in front of the mothers of the victims. This unusual punishment was later overturned for being illegal, but before Mughal was executed in the year 2000, he was found dead with one of his accomplices in his jail cell. The death was suspected suicide by hanging, but autopsies later found that both men had been beaten prior to death, leading to the belief that the deaths were staged to look like a suicide. To this day, many of Mughal's 100 victims remain unidentified, and he is known as the most notorious killer in Pakistan's history. Number six. Why do we do Thora that? Was only 10 years old when she committed her first murder had already attempted murder several times before that. Mary was abused at an early age with her mother attempting to kill her twice. This is believed to be the origins of Mary's growing psychotic behavior. Mary would torture animals and was a known bully who had been caught many times strangling other children and complaints were even made to the police. In 1968, before her 11th birthday, Mary, accompanied by her 13-year-old friend Norma, strangled a four-year-old named Martin Brown in an abandoned building. Because Mary's hands were too small to be bruises, the police assumed that the cause of death was by accidental overdose of pills due to an empty bottle of medication found in the bottle. Four days later, Mary showed up to Martin's parents' home and asked to see him. When his mother explained that the boy had passed away, Mary replied, Oh, I know he's dead. I wanted to see him in his coffin. Days after the murder, Mary and Noma broke into a nursery school and vandalized the place with messages written in a childlike handwriting, admitting responsibility to the murder. The messages read, We did murder Martin Brown, and I murder so that I may come back. The police wrote the incident off as a prank. Two months later, Mary and Noma murdered three-year-old Brian Howe again by strangulation. Mary then used a pair of scissors to cut the boy's hair and mutilate his body and genitals even going as far as to carve the letter M into his stomach. The murder led to questioning by the police of local children, and Norma quickly <clears throat> admitted that it was Mary who had done the killings. Norma was acquitted for these murders, and Mary was convicted to an indefinite sentence. After only 12 years, Mary was released in 1980 and granted a new identity. She went on to have a daughter, and her identity was rediscovered by journalists in 1998. In 2003, she and her daughter were granted anonymity, new identities by the court. She continues to live a normal life to this day. Number seven. Don't tell me she's still alive. Albert Fish is known as one of the most gruesome and insane serial killers of all time. All of his murders included sexual abuse, torture, and cannibalism of his victims. He confessed to three murders between 1924 and 1928, but is suspected in at least five more. Fish was born in 1870 to a family with a long history of mental illness. At the age of five, Fish was put into an orphanage after the death of his father due to his mother's inability to afford raising him. Whilst in the orphanage, Fish was subject to constant beatings, which would lead to his abnormal behavior. He began to take pleasure from the pain and would pursue this fetish later in life. His mother later removed him from the orphanage at the age of nine. At the age of twelve, 
Fish began a relationship with a boy that reintroduced him to further disturbing fetishes, such as consuming urine and feces. In 1890, he moved to the by his That's what he's here too. Albert Fish appeared to have a little no. He had six children with Anna Hoffman and worked as a house painter. Around 1910, he had a sadomasochistic relationship with a 19 year old man named Thomas Kebby. It is unsure whether or not this relationship was consensual, as Thomas was suspected to be mentally disabled. Fish later confessed to torturing and mutilating Thomas in an abandoned farmhouse for two weeks before leaving him there to die. He intended to cut him up and eat him but was worried that the warm weather and smell would give him away. In 1917, his wife left him, and it is believed that this was the beginning of Fish's history of self-harm. He was eventually charged for the torture and murder of three children, but it was the murder of Grace Bud that ultimately led to his capture and prosecution. In 1928, Fish saw an ad for a young man seeking employment. He responded to the ad by going to the address in person and assuming a fake identity of a farmer looking for help. While talking to the man and his family, the man's little sister, Grace Bud, aged 10 years old, came in and Fish decided that she would be his next victim. He made up a story about having to attend a niece's birthday that evening and asked permission to bring Grace along. The parents agreed, but unfortunately that would be the last they ever saw of their daughter. Following her disappearance, the family had no evidence because Fish had given them a fake name and fake address. It wouldn't be until six years later when Fish sent an anonymous letter to Grace's parents that he would be caught and charged with her murder. The grisly letter described how he murdered Grace and then ate her body. I cooked her to death, then cut her in small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook and eat it. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. Fish was found guilty after a 10-day trial, and in January 1936, he was put to death in the electric chair. Number 8. The Golden State Killer is a name given to the man responsible for what was thought to be multiple crime sprees by multiple people. These crimes occurred from 1974 to 1986, and were only confirmed to be the same individual recently after the use of DNA testing. The Golden State Killer is responsible for at least 12 murders, over 50 rapes, more than 120 murders. These crimes would happen in spurts in different regions, which is why they were assumed to be committed by different people. In 1977, an individual claiming to be the killer sent a poem entitled Excitement's Crave to a news agency, a TV station, and to the mayor of Sacramento. A portion of the poem reads, Accepting some work to perform, at fixed pay, but promise for more, is a recognized social norm, as is decorum, seeking lore. Achieving while others lifting should be cause for deserving fame. Leisure tends to excite and seek it. What's right and expected seems tame. The writer suggests an intelligent murderer is bored and seeks to escalate the violence of his crimes. In April of 2018, authorities finally charged 72-year-old Joseph D'Angelo for these crimes based on genetically related family methods via a commercial DNA and ancestry website. His trial is still underway, and his 171-page arrest warrant can be read online, listing all current charges. Damn. David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, was a notorious murderer in New York between 1976 and 1977. He killed six people and wounded seven more during a spree in which he claims he was driven by possession and insanity. Berkowitz was adopted at a young age and was told that his mother had died at birth. He joined the army at the age of 17 and served in Korea and received an honorable discharge after three years of service. He discovered that his birth mother was still alive and contacted her. After being told the details of his illegitimate birth, he felt further alienated and had an identity crisis. In the mid-70s, he began his killing spree first by stabbing and later shooting with a signature 44 caliber gun. He targeted young women with long, dark hair, often shooting them in parked cars in front of their boyfriends. Local women were so afraid to look like the son of Sam's type that they went out of their way to change their hair color with dyes and wigs or cut their hair short. Berkowitz was caught in 1977 after a woman described his car parked near the scene of a shooting on the same night. Berkowitz would later blame his neighbor's dog for the murders, claiming that it was possessed by demons that told him to kill. In the 1990s, he would later recant his demon dog confession, stating that he was a member of a satanic cult and that he was involved in planned ritual murders, although none of these claims can be proven. He 
Right. Alright hey guys, I'm gonna <coughs> see you guys uh my third one and my fourth one so I see you then.